Good afternoon. Uh, this is David Eastwood, Geotech Engineering and Testing. Um, welcome to our presentation on environmental geotechnical considerations uh, for design and construction of educational facilities. Uh, this is going to be a you know big presentation. Uh, it's going to be about two and a half hours. Um, we got about 170 people RSVP'd on this uh, webinar. We got a lot of school districts, civil engineers, architects uh, that are listening on this thing here. Some of the people from the cities as well. So we got a big audience here. You need to reach me. Uh, my email is de at geotecheng.com. My number is 713-699-4000. Uh, this presentation is going to be on YouTube, so you can go out there and watch it again, or your staff can go out there and watch it. There's a lot of information here. I don't expect you to get, get learn everything today. You may have to go watch this several times to gain all the stuff that I put in here or use it as a reference. So I'm, I'm putting a lot of stuff into it. I could do it a lot longer, too. This is a two-and-a-half-hour deal, so I can do a five-hour one, but... There's just a limit to how much we can put into something. If you have questions, uh, please uh, type it in. I'll answer it as I go through the presentation. Um, I'm with Geotech Engineering and Testing. We've been around for about 37 years. We do geotechnical, environmental materials, geoforensic work. We have a staff of 60 engineer, geologists, technicians. We work all over Texas. Louisiana, Oklahoma, New Mexico, and we have our own rigs. So you know how it is for your school districts. You got to get out there and do the job quick so we can get on the project the next day. School projects, school buildings. There's a lot of facilities in schools. I mean, they, they're building this beautiful buildings out there. This is uh, one of the school districts, Sheldon ISD, a high school project, you know, Dickinson High School. Uh, this is another one, Tascosita School, high school. This is Magnolia High School out there in Magnolia ISD. Uh, this is another school out there in Splendora ISD. So there are a bunch of different types of uh, school buildings out there. They're beautiful, great architecture. Some of them look like big universities. And... Uh, we also have a lot of parking facilities. Uh, we got concrete paving. This is a four Ben ISD deal. Uh, so this is one is a four Ben ISD as well. It's concrete paving as a stadium. Again, uh, it's another school project. Another school project is again concrete paving in the area stadium. Concrete drive. Asphalt paving. That's New Kenny ISD. Uh, their stadium, their school. Uh, we have bus drives that we need to be worried about. You know, they're going to have to have certain paving design. And again, one of the things I try to do in this presentation, make it not too technical. I just give you the answers. And so they give you the general, what the numbers should be around for building school, schools around the Houston area, all the way from Sam Houston Texas A&M and Houston area. Uh, so these buses, they're going to have uh, basically heavy traffic loading out there. And so you have to design your drives where the buses go uh, for the bus loading. Uh, we have bus service stations and uh, bus uh, bus repair areas. This is Sheldon ISD. Again, you can see all the buses they've got out there in their parking area. This is another uh, facility for the buses. You can see a Cypher ISD here, bus facility. Dumpsters, you know, some of these schools got these big dumpsters out there. They're heavy. So uh, they got it designed for the area where you keep the trash and dumpster areas. Stadiums. These stadiums, of course, are beautiful. Uh, they build them all over the place. You know, they got turf. They got all these uh, bleachers. 
poles, signs. You got to do design for all these stuff, these big signs and lights and stuff like that. And you got to design for these things. And uh, it's a new Kenny uh, Stadium right there. It's got pretty good size uh, stadium there. These stadiums, you know, this is Sam Houston. It's got uh, nice, a lot of nice bleachers out there. This is new Kenny ISD. You can see a Splendora ISD. This is a uh, Magnolia ISD. It's got a small bleacher that are kind of screwed into the concrete uh, paving here or pad that they've got. These light poles, they got a lot of load on them, both compressive, lateral, bending moments. Got to design these poles for the prescribed loading. Some of these uh, school districts and stadiums, they got these big signs that uh, subject to major wind loading and they're sitting on drill piers. So you got to design these things for uh, the wind loading that they have. They got lateral loaded. This is Hall Stadium, Fort Bend ISD. Again, this is Sam Houston State University sign. Running tracks. They're coming pretty fancy. This is a Spandora ISD uh, running track there. Um, Hall Stadium, Fort Bend ISD. Magnolia ISD. Uh, these stadiums go with turf. These are artificial turf that uh, they got to be designed and uh, properly installed. They got a lot of turf problems here and there. This is New Kenny ISD. Sam Houston. Sam Houston. So you got to design for these turf. Somebody's got a question here of you. Mr. Eastwood host me panelist. I don't know what that means, host me. Uh, yeah, if you have questions, please uh, shoot me any a question and answer section and uh, let me know what you mean. What, what do you mean by that? And so uh, these are the turfs. Got to design them. Some of them don't perform. Worry, Got to worry about tennis courts. They come in all shapes and forms. Natatoriums, some of these schools I just did, uh, Bel Air High School, and they have a big natatorium in there. Detention pond, this is uh, Splendor ISD. You gotta have to have your detention pond here at school to prevent flooding. Sheldon ISD detention pond. So here's the, the the big deal here that we're going to cover today. We're going to talk about how you're going to get the land basically for a school and what your feasibilities should look like. Some of the feasibilities should include phase one environmental site assessment, wetlands, faulting, and soil testing. So we're going to talk about laboratory testing, drilling, uh, analysis of data, expansive soils, what the potential vertical rise means. We're going to talk about various foundation designs for school and uni university buildings. We're going to talk about the effect of trees on, on foundations and paving. We're going to talk about various parking structures all the way from parking lots, driveways, bus lanes, dumpster paths, and stabilization. We're going to talk about uh, stadiums, bleachers, poles, signs, running tracks, artificial uh, turf. We'll talk about detention pond, tennis course, natatorium, and buildings on slopes like Sam Houston University. So, so it's got to be pretty comprehensive stuff here that we go through here. You know, to build a school, you know, you're going to have different site conditions. You have a nice site like this, nice and dry. You can go out there and drive a truck on top of it. Sometimes you've got some areas that got water there and some uh, cows on some of these sites. Um. These are sites where you can get on it. Some of them are heavily wooded. You got to clear some of those trees to get on some of these things. And so uh, various site conditions. One of the first things you got to do, you got to do a phase one environmental site assessment. Make sure that site that you're going in is not 
contaminated. You know, if there's an old service station near the property that you're trying to uh, buy, some of these old, you know, service stations that got these tanks, they starts leaking. And if they do that and they contaminate your site, then you're responsible for all the cleanup costs. It doesn't matter that uh, you didn't cause it, uh, you know, nearby service station did, but, uh, you know, you got to have to clean that site up. So you got to worry about all these drums and, and storage tanks that are contaminating the soil. And so, uh, I don't know, if you're in Texas City, for example, you got these tanks out there, you got to build a school over here. Uh, you got to worry about these tanks leaking and contaminating this site here. So you got to watch out for those things. Um, some of these sites out there near Deer Park ISD, uh, and uh, you know you got you got pipelines and stuff like that. Some of these sites, the pipelines bust, and you can see that some of these uh, landfills that are uh, out there near uh, Crosby ISD area, Hoffman area ISD. So they got the waste out there, and uh, when the rains, uh, the rains basically washes this waste. They're called leachates. They get into the soil and groundwater system. So you got to watch out when you're near a landfill. You got to run into some of these cleaners near your project. These cleaners, if they have underground tanks with cleaners that are carcinogens, these things can get into soil and groundwater and contaminate the area. So you got to really watch for uh, uh, some of these cleaners. If you're out there in the for HISD in the Midtown area trying to build a school, you got to do a tear down an old structure. You know you got to have to worry about asbestos, lead based paint. So you're going to have some kind of a management on those things where you turn down existing schools. You know, like you know Bel Air High School, they had to tear down some of the stuff to build your new school. So you, when you tear this stuff up, an old school to build a new one, uh, you're going to have to worry about asbestos and. Uh, and lead-based paint. Of course, you cannot build schools where the cemeteries are located. Um, if you got a site here in Pasadena ISD, um, got right here on Red Bluff, you want to develop a school in here, uh, there's nothing here right now. And then as soon as you develop the area and all that, for example, you're going to have a service station here. You're going to have a cleaner here, car wash, chemical plant gas stations, all these things can have risk on your property here. So you got to be worried about uh, some of the contaminations from the su surrounding facilities. Here's again another project in here. That's in Pearland ISD area. There's a track in here, and they're trying to develop that. And then you see the Kroger service station in here. Uh, you got a credit union. You got a Golden Corral. You got an NTB. And if these things are upgrading, and that means higher elevation than your site, there's a plume of contamination can come to your, your site. So you got to worry about it and evaluate the risk on your project. This is a track out here in uh, Midtown, well, actually uh, Heights in Houston area. And uh, they were trying to develop that to build condos on it. And uh, at the time, there was just, in 1925, there was just one house out there. In 1969, they have all these houses there, and there was a service station here. This site was contaminated. We had to dig out the stuff and uh, remove it uh, before uh, we built uh, the new facilities. This is Kingwood area. You see all these oil wells? They got oil pits. These oil pits can cause contamination. So you got to watch out for those things. So when you develop a site, it's part of your site feasibility. You look for oil wells and environmental conditions. So if this is your site, you try to develop these red dots are things that can cause contamination on site on your site. So this is a risk risk based analysis, and we want we want to find out what the risk of contamination to your site is as a result of all these facilities. And you get a map findings like this that tells you you got how many leak, leaky underground storage tanks you have within a mile, how many underground storage tanks within a mile. Here you got like one leaky underground storage tanks within one eighth of a mile, 10 of them within half a mile. So it just goes over those things, talks about super fun sites, all the other things that can cause contamination. So it's called phase one environmental site assessment. You do a site reconnaissance, do check with EPA, TCEQ, Texas Railroad Commissions. You check historical land use, interview the people around and 
property owners. Sometimes you do title review. Uh, this is based on ASDM 1527. If there's existing building on it, like a old school, then you got to demolish it. You got to worry about asbestos, lead-based paint. If there is potential for contamination, you get into what's called a phase two environmental site assessment. So that's in accordance to ASTM E1903. You go out there and you see some of the uh, contaminants in there, free products, and uh, in, sitting out there uh, in the manhole, the whole site is committed, contaminated. So if you're out there starting to uh, build out there near uh, Sheldon ISD or, or you're out there in uh, Pasadena ISD, some of those areas along I-10 uh, going east, uh, you know, there are some contaminated sites out there on 225 out there near LaPorte. Uh, so you got to worry about doing these schools out there uh, uh, that are these areas that are contaminated. Surface water contamination, you got the pipeline busting. So if you go out there, for example, in Mount Bellevue area, lots of pul pipelines, Pasadena, Laporte, uh, Baytown. So if you're out there on any of these uh, uh, areas, uh, you're going to have to worry about uh, the some of these uh, environmental conditions of the pipeline busting, the damage to the well, to the wildlife. This is a wellhead. That wellhead was in Cypher ISC area, where they were clearing the site. And uh, so that we found this thing, we had to go back and check with TCEQ. It was not in their data records. So we had to find out what's going on. We did a bunch of borings, make sure it was not contaminated. If your site's got contaminated soils, one of the things you can do among other things is to dig out the contaminated soils. You put them, stockpile them, you put cover on them so that uh, if it rains, it's not gonna leach out. Then you put them in the containers, you cover them, take them to an industrial landfill. Then you compact that site with a select structural fill. You eight inch lifts all the way to the top. Well, it doesn't have to be select, but, but with structural fill. All the way to the top, an eight inch lifts, compact 95% of standard proctor. If the depth is more than five feet, you're gonna compact 100% standard proctor density. Wetland. Uh, if you got sites that are uh, that, that you're buying that are basically areas that uh, are inundated and saturated by surface or groundwater at a frequency duration sufficient to support normal circumstances to support a prevalence of vegetation, typically for saturated soil conditions, wetlands are included swamps, marshes, bogs, and other areas, and they're regulated by U.S. Corps of Engineers. So we got a bunch of wetlands here: Harris County, Montgomery County, Fort Wayne County, Brazoria County, uh, Waller County. So you got to have to, you know, design for those things. Oh, uh, these are typical pictures of wetland areas. This is Galveston County, and you can see that the water is coming all the way up to here. And uh, so this is another one on I-45 South. If you're out there driving, and you can see some of the wetlands. This is League City area. And then you can see the uh, the wetland near uh, Clear Creek ISD area. Uh, you can see more wetlands pictures. See the water coming all the way up to here. So to have wetlands, you need to have water, certain type of plants, and certain type of soils. They call it hydric soils, soils that have been underwater, smell like rotten eggs. So uh, hydric soils, water-loving vegetation, wetland hydrology, saturation for seven days during the growing season. You got to meet all these three criteria to have wetlands. If you want to have water on that site to see if you don't want to know these are jurisdictional water, you got to go in there and get with Corps of Engineers and form, fill out the short form, Clean Water Act 404. You uh, send it in and, you know, basically they're going to say that based on their preliminary evaluation, you don't have a wetland or they may get into a deep one. So, you really need to get a wetland consultant to help you with that. Wetland delineation are conducted in accordance with 1987 U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Wetland Design Delineation Manual. Subsidence. So parts of Houston area is subsiding because we're taking all this groundwater and oil from the ground, and we do that, the ground starts going down. Subsidence is lowering of the elevation of the land, surface water time. Subsidence can cause wide range of, of consequences depending on location 
of the occurrence and proximity to the service drainage and coastal area. In Houston area, climate compaction resulting from groundwater withdrawal is the primary cause of subsidence. Now, if you go out there to Baytown and Laporte and Pasadena, you know, if you're digging holes out there and uh, you pumping oil out and uh, those wells, you know, that causes subsidence as well. So initially our ground looks like this here and you got all this stuff and the ground, the soils are all about what we call flocculated. That's the structure of the soil. We start pumping the water out, the ground starts subsiding, increases the effective stress in soils and the ground starts dropping, so it's called subsidence. And, you know, these are the aquifer in the Houston area, for example, Chico aquifer all the way down to Jasper. They go several thousand feet deep. You put wells in it and take the water out for usage. As you do that, the ground starts subsiding. This is Katy. This is Galveston. So if you go all the way to Grimes County, and these are big aquifers, that are which basically there are big bodies of sand full of water. So there are several, like, you know, Chico Aquifer goes all the way to 1,200 feet deep. Some of these uh, aquifers go all the way down to 10,000 feet deep. You put wells in there and you take the water out, the ground is, start, is going to start uh, settling. This is a Goose Creek area near Baytown. This area was above the water, but, you know, basically three foot of subsidence caused it to go underwater. These are back the old days, the engineers looking at faults. Here you can see. Uh, checking out the stuff. Um, you can see if you have a subsidence, the area floods. And uh, this is Baytown. There was a wellhead. And uh, they, they built this wellhead. Uh, wellhead was at the at grade in 2004, essentially. Then because of the subsidence, uh, the whole area starts dropping. And you can see the, the void under the wellhead. wellhead. This is Kingwood area that's flooding as a result of subsidence. And uh, this is a Brownwood area subdivision in Baytown. In 1994, there were a bunch of, you know, Exxon executives lived there in a really nice area. And then it starts subsiding. And you can see 1953, 1978, 1989, 2002, 2012. So basically the whole place went underwater. This is a 1906 to 1987 subsidence map showing that parts of the Houston area subsidence was nine feet near Baytown and stuff. So we got a big bowl out of here. And it's not elastic. So if you stop using the groundwater, it's not gonna come back up. This is a recent uh, map of subsidence in Montgomery County. And you can see the Montgomery County essentially is dropping at, at the right of uh, the, the rate of uh, 16 millimeter per year, roughly. That's about a, almost half an inch. And so, you know, there's a subsidence all over the stuff. Fort Bend County is experiencing, uh, Brazoria County is experiencing subsidence. If you're around the Houston area, subsidence in Jersey Village is about it's five centimeters, that's two inches per year between 1992 and 2000. Between 2000 and 2011, spring with Woodlands area dropped about a half, one inch one inch per year. Uh, in 2012 and 2020, the Katy area dropped basically about almost one inch a year, 0.75 inch a year. So as the population grows, and if you use more groundwater, the more subsidence you're going to have. For example, Berzoria County is going to, by year 2050, by growth by 21%. Chambers County by 120%, Fort Bend by 74%. So, you know, you're talking about Lamar Consolidated having a lot of students over that whole area is booming. You know, Galveston County, 14%, Harris County, 17%, Montgomery County, 71%, Waller, 79%. So there's a lot of growth going on. This is the latest from the uh, Harris County flood, uh, not Harris County flood, but uh, Harris County Subsidence District map of uh, between 2010 and 2050 predicted uh, subsidence that you can see Harris County, Fort Bend, these are about a one and a half foot. These are 1.5, these are one. So there's a lot of uh, subsidence that's gonna occur. 
So what we're doing to mitigate that, mitigate that is we're going to surface water systems. We're using North Harris County Water Authority, West Houston Water Authority, North Fort Bend Water Authority, San Jacinto River Authority, and others to take surface water so that we do not dig at wells to get groundwater to cause subsidence. Attics area to be dropping roughly half an inch a year. And uh, this is the number of years in the ground dropping. Pasadena kind of stabilizing. And if you look at the, the previous map that showed in here, this area of Houston is kind of stabilizing and it's not experiencing subsidence. Subsidence is happening in the area of the high growth area. When you go to Katy out there in Fort Bend area in Montgomery County, South Montgomery, Montgomery County, you're going to have subsidence. So all these subsidence cause flooding, of course. And uh, and what happens is as it subsides, uh, you know, it creates faults. So if you got a part of Houston that's dropping, the other part is stable, there are cracks in the ground that have been there for millions of years. These cracks become activated and they're called geologic faults. They're not earthquake faults. And you can see the crack in here can go down 200 feet. That's in Ellington Field, I-45 South area. There are about 300 faults in the Houston area, all the way from Corpus Christi to Beaumont to Houston. They move about half an inch a year. So as a part of your feasibility study for a school project building, you got to check to see if your site's got a fault on it. So you do what's called a phase one fault study. So if you got a fault going through your project, this is what we call downthrown section of the fault. This is the upthrown section of the fault. This is called shear zone. And so you can't build anything on top of the fault. So don't go out there and build a school on a fault. There's tons of faults, for example, near Paraline ISD. This is down the down, down thrown. This is the upthrown section of a fault. And uh, so you can't build on the fault. This is the shear zone. This is a Kingwood area, not Kingwood, the Woodlands area. Uh, this is a house on top of the fault. See the lineation of the fault going all old out there, cracking the paving, going towards that building. Again, you can see here the fault's kind of causing a bump. Right there, this is the post oak fault near Galleria. So if faults got consists of two components, an upthrown section, a downthrown section. These are soil layers that go out of whack. The downthrown starts dropping. So the clay soil goes like this. So you do borings in here and do geophysical, and you find out where the scarp is, where the actual lineation of the fault is. This is called fault scarp. So you look at aerial photos, you can see the lineation here. This is the downthrown section, this is the upthrown. Downthrown is darker. So uh, that means there's more water there. Again, you can see the lineation out there. This is the downthrown, it's the upthrown. So you can't go build a school building here or parking lot. Again, you see the fault lineation. This is the downthrown, this flooded, upthrown section. Some of these sites are heavy wooded, so you can't tell easily you got, if you got a fault there. So in the cases where you have high weeds, like you have out there, uh, like you know many of their school districts, like Galena Park area, for example, ISD, you know we got it out there, and of course, Aldina ISD, some of these fields, uh, you have to go out there and use what's called uh, lidar to find out if there's a change in elevation. Lidar uses laser light to measure distances. So with a plane or, you know, you can basically send the laser lights and find this elevation, depending on how much time it gets to hit the ground, comes back to the receiver, you can get the elevations. And uh, basically you can map up the elevations on your site. This is a LIDAR map. Okay, this is long point fault. This is the site they're going to develop and the line, you know, basically faults going right through the property. So I wouldn't buy that property to build a school on it or maybe even condos. You got to be away from the fault line. These are some of the fault maps in Texas. We have them in Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin. The stuff in San Antonio, Austin, and uh, are not active. So you can build over there. Some of the soils may be different across the fault line. Uh, but in Houston, Beaumont area, you got to check for faulting every time you do a feasibility study. 
for any kind of a school project. And so these are LIDAR maps in here where you can see, you know, long point faults in here. So some of the faults are in various ISD areas. These are uh, basically presentation is going to be on YouTube. So you can have access to these fault maps that you can see all over the Houston. For example, you got Paradigm ISD. You got to watch out for faults in your projects, even Waller ISD. And you can see the fault maps in Houston, in the multiple. There are more faults that are shown in these maps. We have a bigger uh, fault maps in our library, but we cannot release it because a lot of these landowners do not want to tell anybody there's a fault on their property and they doesn't want it to be public. So, for example, if you're doing the, the school out there in Pearland out there, this is Macava Salt Dome, and you can see that development right there. This is the track. There's a pipeline, but this is a fault going right through it. So to have a fault going through it, you develop what's called a hazard zone. You cannot build buildings in this hazard zone. It's about 130 foot wide. So you don't put it in. Uh, you put the linear detention here, or you can make it a park. The up thrown section is about 30, 40 foot wide. Down thrown section is about 80 foot wide. Down thrown section moves more. So therefore you have to have a wider space between the fault line and where your building line is. So this is a school project that's going in the uh, uh, Pearland Parkway area that we're gonna build it over here next to the fault. You know, there was very, uh, we were scared of the fault. So we put it on deep piers with anchor bolts and this is a beam, allowed that the building be leveled if uh, there's movements. So anyway, that's another part of the feasibility or actual design of the school. You got to do a geotechnical study. This is our building here, and uh, we've got a 36,000 square foot building. These are our rigs. This goes about 120 foot deep. These are portable to go down about 25 foot deep. These other rigs go about 30 foot deep. And we've got ATVs that we can pull rigs, uh, these portable rigs behind them. And so we have our own rigs. We've got eight rigs. So we can mobilize on school projects real quickly. So if you got a site like this, like this, we send our rigs out there. These are truck mounted rigs. You can drive on them and do the boardings. This is a water truck. This is a regular truck rig. You got to use water to do wash boring, use bentonite. So uh, this is a typical uh, truck rig that uh, we, we did this a village school, Vikings uh, project with it. We did boardings on it. Again, more school projects. This is a truck mounted rig. Another project, school project, truck mounted rig. And you can see more truck around at me, rigs, truck mounted rigs for school projects. Um, so if your site is, you know, basically the KDISD area where you got these sandy soils out there, when it gets wet, it starts pumping. So in those areas, you're going to have to use a buggy rig. These are big tire rigs. This is Fort Bend ISD. So you're gonna have to use a big uh, area. This area would get use a swamp buggy rig. These buggies, they got big tires and you go through mud and do the boardings out there. And you can see the buggies right there. Sometimes on, on a smaller projects, we can pull our portable rig. These portable rigs can go up to about 25 foot deep and get samples and get your job done quickly. Again, this is an area, if you're out there building out there, uh, basically near Condor ISD area. Some of those areas are heavily wooded. Then there may be some clearing may, may have to be done. You clear a path out there to get the, to the location and do the boardings out there. This is a portable rig system. Uh, we had to use that the Houston airport system hobby because they didn't want something with a big boom sticking out. So we did boardings with our portable rig system. Goes down about 25 foot deep. We do the borings next to the biggest building on the biggest tree on the site. Uh, trees have root fibers. Tell us how deep your piers got to be for your school buildings. Knowing root fibers. So this is a portable rig. You drive the sampler into the ground. Here's you drive it in. This is the tree. You drive it in there. This is a Shelby tube sampler about three inches in diameter, three foot uh, long. You hydraulically push it. This is hollow. Hydraulically pushing into the soil, you get a soil sample like that. 
You cut the ends, put it in foil, give it a job number. You put it in a wax box. You measure root fibers. Root fibers identify the depth of the active zone. So basically, active zone usually is about two foot below the lowest root fiber that you find. This is an eight to 10 foot. We find root fibers in Houston all the way down to about 18, 20 foot deep. So my active zone can be 20 foot deep in Houston especially near Astrodome uh, out there, near uh, some of this stuff near Houston ISD, South or Pearland ISD or Fort Bend ISD. Some of those areas, they got really bad stuff. And um, in the areas that are so sandy, for example, if I'm out there in Katy ISD, you got to do uh, sample the sands. Some of these sands out there, uh, you got to do a standard penetration test on them. This is a 140 pound hammer drop, but, uh, 18 inch, 30 inches. We drive into the ground 18 inches. Again, it's a 140 pound hammer. You drive into the ground eight, 18 inches, six inch, six inch, six inch. And you measure the blow counts. You disregard the first six inches and you get the blow counts. This is a split spoon sampler. You can see the sand in there. So if you have sand out there, if you blow counts between zero to four, you got loose sands, very loose sands. 5 to 10 is very loose, medium dense, 11 to 30, dense, 31 to 50, over 50 is very dense. So, for example, you find a lot of dense sands out there. If you're doing stuff uh, near Sam Houston State University, you're going to find some good medium dense sands. If you start going deeper, you're going to hit rock. So, if I'm in Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, if I below a certain depth, I can hit limestone shale you know austin chalk so we have to core the rock and come up with foundation design on that groundwater when we do borings let's say we're out there in kdist we hit the water about 20 foot deep this water table fluctuates seasonally so if you go out there in february when we have a lot of rain uh march that water table is going to be shallow it may be five foot deep but if you go out there in the summer in august time it may be 30 foot deep so Water table fluctuates. That's very important for you for your design because if you're putting storm sewer in, sanitary lines, you want to know where the water is. Also, if you're going out there, put your piers in, you want to know where the water is so that you don't have caving problems. The way you measure water level, he's got a weight. At the end of the tape, you throw it in the hole, and when it goes plump, you hit the water. And here's another, another way, you, you know, again, basically put a tape measure with a weight, you throw it in the hole, and then you measure the water level. Places such as Going out there to Katy ISD, Royal ISD, some of these areas in Cy Fair ISD, Waller ISD, Tomball ISD, Magnolia ISD, Montgomery ISD, Navasota ISD. All these areas have uh, potential problems with this sandy layer over clay. It's called per causes perch water table. Basically, sand gets saturated and basically uh, sits on top of the clay. So when you go out there and do site clearing and start building your site, it starts pumping. This water just sits on top of the clay. It's called perch water table. And uh, so you got to design for that. And we can go through all that later. So uh, when you buy a piece of property again for your school, you got to do preliminary due diligence. That includes environmental site assessment, fault study, and preliminary geotechnical. So you go out there and sprinkle one boring every 10 acres on your property that you're buying just to see what kind of soil you have. You don't want to buy a school project built site that, for example, has got a lot of earthwork requirements. For example, if it's got perch water table or you got high PBR, typically you want to really be worried about projects with PBR of greater than about 4.5 inches. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute, what that is. So you conduct borings every 10 acres, the number of borings, for typical school projects uh, or uh, you know stadiums, you got to watch out for those things. Or uh, stadiums, <clears throat> parking lots, or buildings, you do one more every 3,000 square foot to 10,000 square foot, depending on the size of the building, to minimum depth of 25 foot. If I'm there putting, putting stuff in Goose, uh, Goose Creek ISD or putting stuff in Condro ISD, uh, Allen ISD, at least go down 25 foot deep. You know, in parking lot areas, you know, every 10,000 square foot, you do a boring to a depth of 10 foot. Bus drive areas, one boring every 500 foot along the drives. Same with jogging track to a depth of 10 foot. 
for stadium poles, uh, you know, depending on the pole size, you need at least a 30 foot boarding. Natatoriums, every 3,000 square foot, you need to put a 25 foot boardings out there. For detention ponds, minimum of three boardings and one boarding for every five acres of the detention pond. And that should be twice the height depth of the pond. So that gives you general guidelines on geotechnical boardings requirements for various uh, school facilities. For running tracks, one boring every 250 feet deep, uh, 250 feet to a depth of 10 feet. Okay, so that's one thing you need to worry about. Uh, the uh, tennis courts, uh, you go one basically boardings to a depth of uh, 20 feet deep for every court. So if you got five courts, you do five boardings to 20 feet. If you have one court, you do two boardings, 20 feet. Bleachers, depending on the size of the bleachers, and if there are heavy, big bleachers, you may have to do 40 foot boardings. If you got little, small ones, you do only 20 foot boardings. Laboratory testing. We get our soil samples, we bring them out there to the lab, you add water to the clay, then it becomes liquid. You get some of that sample, you put it in a cup, cut a groove through it, turn this 20, 30 times. When it comes together, you get some of that sample, you weigh it, you get wet weight of it, you put it in the oven and dry it up, and you get a dry weight of it. The difference with the wet weight and dry weight, we don't want to know how much water is in that soils. So we wind, we find out how much water is in that soil for it to behave liquid. The other test we do in the laboratory is called plastic limit test. In this test, we take the soil sample, roll it to one eighth of an inch, and get the wet weight of it. You put it in the oven to dry it up. You get the dry weight of it. So we want to find out how much water for the soil for the soil for it to behave semi-plastic. So the difference between liquid and plastic limits depends how much water it takes for the soil to be liquid, how much to soil to be semi-plastic. It's called plasticity index. So if your PI is less than 20, you got low soil potential. Between 20 and 30, you've got moderately expansive soils. Between 30 and 40, you got highly expansive soils. Above 40 is very high. String tests, uh, it's very important to know where your poles go, your bleachers, and your building foundations in terms of strength of the soils. Come with the, some of the simple tests are hand penetrometer and toll rate. In a hand penetrometer, you push this thing into the soil and you measure the soil strength. And then toll rate, again, you put it at the end of the sample, you shear it in, tor shear it in torsion, and it gives you an estimate strength of the soil. This is a basically unconfined compression test. In this test, you put the soil sample and crush it. This is the proving ring, this deflection. You shear that soil, you know how much load you can put on it. That tells you how much load you can put in your drill piers or auger cast piles or your spread footings or your grade beams. That's how you determine the load carrying capacity. Consolidation test. If I'm doing a stadium, I want to know how much that building is going to settle. You put a soil sample in a cup like this, essentially. And then you you seal it like this. You put it in the machine right there and you put loads on it. Equal to the column loads that's going on your foundation. So if you got a big stadium, you got a column load of 100 kips, you got to load it up to 100 kips and trying to find out as this is a void ratio, this is a load. As the load increases, that soil shrinks, basically settles. So you use that settlement on the soil sample. It's called basically void ratio versus uh, pressure to estimate how much that soil is going to settle. We're going to tell you how much settlement you're going to have on your column. Typically, you don't want to have more than one inch. Now, one of the problems that we're going to run into, for example, in some of the ISTs that they got expansive soils, such as Galena Park, Deer Park, La Porte, Clear Creek, Channel View, Pearland, Alvin, all these guys, we got expansive soils. So we take the soil samples, and load it up to the what's called geostatic stress, the initial soil sample that in the ground, the load has been experiencing. And you load it up there, then you let it swell, and then you load it back down. Here, you get your swell pressure. So we're going to get all estimated swell here. So again, in this test here, we got this equipment in here, piece of equipment. You put your cell sample to cell like that. Then you cover the cell up. Then you, again, just like consolidation test, you load it up to the geostatic stress. This is like four foot deep, for example, and you let it swell. Add water to it, let it swell. As it swells, you measure the swell on it. This is the time, this is the swelling of the soil. And you can see in this case here, this soil swelled 1.2%. So 
So that's a significant amount over a 10 foot area. That's a significant swelling that you're going to experience. So what we do, we get a swell sample. You put geostatic stress on it. You let it swell, then you bring it all the way down to get the swell pressure. Some of these soils got swell pressures of two, four thousand, eight thousand psf. So you got to, you know, the soils can actually move buildings. Soil tops around the Houston and Texas area, we have a lot of clay soils. This is a site that's got a lot of clay on it. Sandy soils. So if you're out there in Galveston ISD, you get a lot of sandy soils. Also KD ISD. Royal ISD, Cypher ISD, Tomball ISD, Waller ISD, Navasota ISD, Montgomery ISD. <coughs> These areas, you're going to run into a lot of sandy soils near the surface that creates perch water table. The same with silt. The silt is as uh, bigger than uh, uh, clay sample size, the, the grains, but the smaller than sand. Really a bad material to build on. Start pumping. So if you're out there, Building out there near the Condro ISD and and and, uh, and KD ISD, you're going to see a lot of these uh, sandy, silty soils, especially south of Condro out there near Loop 336 South. So uh, that's the kind of stuff you're going to see there. So we have clays, then you get into red clay, white clay, and start beginning to rock, and you know stuff like that. So if you're in Dallas, you're going to get into limestone. If you're out there in Sam Houston University. You may see some gravel out there below a certain depth in sandy soils. Again, this is rock out there, limestone, fill. We can build our school on top of fill, no problem, as long as that fill is low organic and compacted to 95% of standard proctor density. Some of the places such as Aleph ISD and Conroe ISD, and as well as uh, uh, Alvin ISD, Fort Bend ISD, uh, Lamar Long Consolidated, all these areas have got these highly expansive soils and during the summertime develop shrinkage cracks and uh, the materials get into these shrinker cracks. And then when it rains, the soil swells and these shrinkage cracks, uh, what happens is the soil cracks at 45 degree angle. They call them slick insides. So if you're out there putting your piers in, you will see that area is going to basically have caving problems or you're building your natatoriums, the side of the Whole excavation it starts collapsing. That's because of presence of these weak planes called slick insides due, sh due to shrinkage crack cracks in your soils. So what we do is we look at the whole area here, what kind of soils we have, look at the geologic map, and you can see Texas. We have a lot of expansive soils out there. Uh, we have various soil conditions, depending where you want to pull your schools. You got to make sure you do a soil test uh, so that you don't have problems with that school. This is the U.S. map that shows the soils that expand to about 1,500%. Again, you see a lot of expansive soils out there. Again, you can see Texas, Louisiana area, a lot of expansive soils, a lot of shrinking soil problems. Uh, Houston, Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, all these areas, they got expansive soils. So you got to design for it. North of Buffalo Bayou is sandy soils. So if you are building out there in Aldine ISD, Spring ISD, Klein ISD, New Caney, all these areas, Splendora ISD, parts of Condor ISD, you're going to hit some of these sandy soils. Huffman ISD, um, this is a map basically that shows depending what kind of a uh, where your school is. For example, you go near Fairfield, you got sandy soils, Cinco Ranch, sandy soils, Siena, you got highly gumbo. Soils with lots of large PBRs in, in trees. You know, you go out there, some of these other areas like Baytown, Laporte, highly expansive soils. Kingwood, highly expansive soils. Some areas real sandy. Uh, Houston ISD, you got moderately to highly expansive soils. So uh, depending where we are, we got different types of soils out there. You go out there to Cleveland ISD, your soils are sandy. Splendora ISD, you got sandy, silty soils. Conroe ISD, you got both. You got sandy uh, sandy soils as well as highly expansive soils. Magnolia ISD, you got moderately expansive sandy soils. Tomball, you got both gumbo and, and uh, sandy soils. Klein ISD, a lot of sandy soils. Spring ISD, a lot of sandy soils. Aldine ISD, sandy soils, moderately expansive soils. Humble ISD, parts of it got expansive soils, part of it is sandy soils. Sheldon ISD, lots of expansive soils. You got Goose Creek, you got lots of expansive soils. 
Crosby ISD, expensive soils. Dayton ISD, ISD highly expensive soils. <coughs> Liberty ISD, lots of expensive soils. Dover, Devers ISD, expensive soils. Anorak, Marley, uh, expensive soils to highly expensive soils. Clear Creek ISD, highly expensive soils. Dickinson, you get a lot of movement there, expensive soils. You go to uh, Galveston ISD, you got sandy soils. Santa Fe, Alvin, you got highly expensive soils. Fort Bend ISD, you got highly expensive soils. Lamar ISD, highly expensive soils. You start hitting Katy and Royal, Royal ISDs. These areas, they got sandy soils on the surface. Below that, you got clays. Waller ISD, you got sandy soils. Some areas, you got mildly expansive soils in those areas. This is a typical boring. You got fat clays, gumbo clays, all the way to 25 foot. PI of 40, 59. Lots of movement. The soil's got a strength of about 1,000 PSF here. It goes all the way to about 3,000 PSF right in here. And so we didn't have any water all the way to 25 foot in here on this site. This is another site, South of Condro, for example. Uh, this is actually in Galveston. Real sandy soils all the way down. So these are standard penetration tests. Blow counts 28, 47, 31, 30, 27. You can put uh, auger cast piles in here, or you can put straight shafts using slurry method of construction. The better, most economical foundation here would be spread footings. So if you go out there trying to build a school out there and you have all these borings out there and you hit a sand layer out there in the middle and you got to put piers in, if your soils here are expansive, top 12 feet, you got to put the piers through the sand and anchor them down here. That means you're going to hit sand and you're going to have caving problems. You got to go a slurry method of construction. Okay, if your soils are not expansive, I'll just put piers in above the sands at about 12 foot deep. Our experience has shows, shown that minimum pier depth should be 12 foot to have less foundation movements. I talked to a lot of foundation repair companies and say usually piers are 8 to 10 foot. They got foundation movements uh, on non-expansive soil areas. Uh, on expansive soil areas, you got to go down 18, 20 foot deep. Potential vertical rise. Potential vertical rise is expressed in inches of potential ability of a soil material to swell. So each ISD in the Houston area has got a PBR that tells you how much movement you can expect on the, in that ISD. And it's called using a Textot 124E as a way to measure the movements. So if you look at all of our ISD here, Fort Bend ISD can move as much as 46 inches, the soils would. Lamar ISD, 46 inches. Stafford ISD, 46 inches. Royal ISD, one to two inches. Katy ISD, one to two inches. Waller ISD, one to two inches of movement. Navasota, one to three inches. Montgomery ISD, one to three inches. Magnolia, one to four inches. Conroe ISD, some areas zero movement, some areas a lot of movement, one to six inches. Splendora ISD, one to two inches. New Caney ISD, one to two inches. Humble ISD, one to two inches. Kaufman, one to two inches. Crosby, two to four. Goose Creek, 46 inches. Anawak, one to three, six inches. Liberty, three to six inches. Barton, three to six. Clear Creek, 46 inches. Santa Fe, three to five. Alvin, 46 inches. Houston ISD, all the way, basically, depending where you are, it can experience anywhere from four to, you know, one to five inches of movement. So I would keep this map there for you guys on the school districts to have an idea of the kind of soils and potential movements you're going to have. It's called PVR, I'm um, developed this map for the Houston school projects. PBR for most buildings should be limited to one inch. So one of the ways to reduce the PBR is basically you make your uh, put sprinkler system. When you put sprinkler sy systems around uh, your building, make sure uh, the, you put them uniformly all around to keep the moisture uniform. If the moisture is not uniform, you're gonna get heave. Your exterior beam should be deep the deeper your exterior beam is, the less chance for water going underneath the building and causing movements. So you may get deep an exterior beam, maybe 36 inches, and uh, put paving around the building. If you put paving around the building, there's less chance of movement because of a change, change, change in movement. Put landscaping. If you put landscaping, put it all around. Make sure there's a uniform moisture around your building. 
Again, look at this here, non-uniform moisture condition, where here you have grass and a lot of water, here you have concrete, so you're gonna develop cracking here. Same here, you got concrete and grass. This area is, gets wet, starts moving. This area doesn't move, so you get cracks here. Again, you need to have positive drainage on your buildings. Uh, the, some of the buildings, they put a little skirt around it to cause it not to move as much. Again, when you build these buildings, uh, don't put sand as a bedding material in your forms. We recommend clays. If you put sand in there, especially if the side is wooded, the, that sand creates water coming underneath your slab and get those dry areas where tree, trees were removed and would cause heave. So I would not use sand underneath in my forms when I put, build my pad. You can remove the expansive soils and you put it with a non-expansive soils. Some school districts do that. So if you got an active zone of 10 foot, what we call movement active zone of 10 foot, soil with PI of 60, you may have to remove seven foot of expansive soils to get a PVR about one inch. Again, most school districts, you wanna have a PVR of about one inch. So we go out there and put select fill in there. The select fill should have a liquid limit less than 40 and PI between 12 and 20. The type of foundations we use for our school projects are Deep foundations such as drill piers, piling, auger cast piles, helical piles, press piling, or for your maintenance buildings, we use conventional reinforced slab or post tension slab, uh, like for tennis courts and stuff as well. We can use the spread footings if you've got sandy soils or mats. So that's one of the things that school districts needs to consider, the kind of foundations to use. If you go out there to University of Houston or uh, Texas A&M, Rice University, a lot of these guys are going with what we call structural slab with piers. They have basically a, a void underneath your the slabs. This structurally supports the, the slabs. You can always go with a slab on fill supported in piers. It's less expan expensive. You can put select fill on the slab to get the PBR less than one inch. And on your maintenance building, you can go with essentially a slab on piers with no fill underneath it that allows the stop to move up, but not down because you've got piers there. The other option is for your maintenance buildings, the cheap stuff, you can go with a conventional reinforced slab or post tension slab. So uh, these are the kind of stuff that you could be using. Drill piers. So you're building a school out there. This is what we call auger rig. You go drill your piers and this is a reamer. You drill the hole. This is a, a project that, that we did for Long Star College, Kingwood. And uh, you can see that we're drilling the piers out of in here. This is the reamers, auger, reamer. You drill the hole. You make sure this thing opens up properly. Make sure your reamer measures the depth that you want. You have your drill pier in here. Make sure there's no more than three inches of water in it. You put your steel cage in it after you drill it. You pour the concrete. Make sure it doesn't hit the sides to get the clay in there. So you pour it vertical. This is your pier out there. You bring the steel all the way up. Some structural engineers recommend not to connect the pier um, to the slab. They put basically a plastic thing here, sleeve on it, so that allows the slab move up and down off the pier. So if this is your pier, these are the sleeve you put in there. This is your grade beam that allows your slab to move up and down. You don't bend it in and dowel it in there and, and basically uh, if you if if you bend it, uh, so if the, the the slab moves, you're going to develop cracking. So we sleeve the the uh, basically still coming out of the piers into the grade beam to allow it to go move up and down. You can see your pier out here. This is the steel. You put void boxes in between the piers. Again, this is Bel Air High School. You got where the piers are, foundation drawings. So one way, the, the important way to determine your pier depth is you got to learn some concepts. Okay, we got the moisture active zone. That's typically about, you know, that's the moisture active zone, especially if you've got trees, your moisture active zone is going to be deeper. The way you determine the depth of the moisture active zone is when you hit a sand layer, that's the active zone depth. When you hit a rock layer, two foot below the lowest root fiber, so that's why it's very important for us to know where the root fibers are in your projects. We show that in all of our logs. Not very many people do that. 
when we change change suction, uh, basically a property of the soils of less than 0.027 PF. When the liquidity index becomes vertical, depths of your slick insides, we've got a whole bunch of slick insides in some of the school districts, such as in Paraline ISD, Allen ISD, Corbin ISD, Lamar ISD, all these areas, A-Leaf ISDs, lots of slick insides. And of course, depth of historical water. So going back here is the moisture active zone. The other thing we need to know what's a movement active zone. Your moisture active zone could be 20 foot deep, but that soil is not going to move even if the moisture changes. You know, you got to know what your movement active zone is. In most areas in Houston, the movement active zone is about 10 foot deep. It also equals what's called zero movement line. The soils above the zero movement line move up and down. Below it, they don't. So you need to anchor your piers below the zero movement line because what happens is the soils, above, you know, basically uh, if you have a compressive loads, you're going to have the loads kind of come over here and you have to have end bearing and skin friction below the zero movement line to reduce downward movement. But what the problem is, what we see more of the time is when you put the piers in the ground, the soils above the zero movement line want to grab your pier and move it up. You're going to have to anchor it below it to, to basically, this, this pier doesn't move up. That's where we see a lot of failures on the school buildings. And you don't count on the bell to resist uplift. Because by the time the bell resists uplift, there's two, three inches of movement. So if you're out there in Paraline, for example, looking at the sound wall in here, we see some, looking at this thing here, some of these piers coming out of the ground. Because the piers are too shallow. So you're going to have to design this stuff that are anchored deep enough so that they're not going to come up. So if I'm doing a uh, building out there, a school building, and I've got a clay all the way down, my PI is 50, my uh, movement active zone is 10 foot, what depth do we put up here? Well, the rule of thumb is twice the depth of the active uh, moisture. So in this case, you put your piers at 20 foot deep. Okay. This is another site. I've got a building in here, got uh, 10 foot of clay, the PI of 40. I, and of course, my uh, active zones movement line is 10 foot. Where do I put the piers? In this case, you put the piers at uh, basically 22 foot deep because the sand has got a lower skin friction than clay. So piers in sand are going to be deeper where you have clay over it. So in terms of the movement active zone, uh, in Houston area is six to 10 foot. Your piers are 12 to 20 foot. In Dallas, Fort Worth, San Antonio, and Austin, your depth of uh, <clears throat> active zone, uh, movement active zone in expansive soils is 15 feet. Your pier is going to be 20, 30 foot deep. So in those areas. So this is move, movement active zone in Houston is about 10 foot. Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin, you got to design for 15 foot. So when you're building schools, this is the kind of a typical floor slab that you're going to get. You're going to have your interior beams, interior columns in here. There's no interior beam in here, a lot of these. And you got, it could be a tail wall building around it or kind of a steel structure. You're going to have to put enough select field underneath the slab to get the movement to less than one inch. So when you put your columns, you put booths around them to isolate the, the, the columns from the floor slab so that if the floor slab is going to start moving up and down, they're not going to lift your columns. So you put basically booth in there. Of course, you put uh, joints in your concrete slab at 15 foot spacing. These are booths that separates the concrete from the steel uh, column. Or you can have anchor bolt stuff with the joints like this circular, uh, diamond shape. You know, that's various stuff that you can, can have. Otherwise, you're going to have cracks between your slab and your columns. You don't want that. This is kind of looking at it the other day. I was at Walmart. They said they went out there and put these joints out there around the columns. Some of them are only half the joint. They didn't have a joint here. Kind of a bad construction. Uh, in the floor slab areas, if your soles are expansive, you go with structural slab with void, uh, structural slab uh, with the structural fill. You can lime stabilize on site soils, use them as fill. You can do chemical stabilization or compaction only if you got. So if I'm out there building out there in uh, uh, basically spring ISD, the soils are non-expansive. 
I just compact the soils in KDISD and just build the floor slab on top of it. So if you can put select fill underneath your building, your select fill should have a liquid limit less than 40 PI between 12 and 20. One of the green options that we can use on our projects is lime stabilization. You can lime stabilize the on-site material. So if I'm out there in Fort Bend ISD and I want to haul in a bunch of soils, I go out there and let's say I need six foot of soil between my slab and, and uh, the bottom of the expansive soils. I go out there and dig out the expansive soils and you put them in the back end and lifts and lime stabilize them and uh, use them underneath the floor slab. This is a green option. You don't have to take stuff off sites. So you can use uh, basically uh, lime stabilization. Uh, structural slab, uh, basically places such as Texas a and Rice University, University of Houston. A lot of these uh, schools, basically you wanna go out there with a uh, structural slab system with void. This is an a and projects building. And you see they go with a structural slab and under the slab, they've got this call space type deal here, put their plumbing that allows the soils to move up and down. It's not gonna lift the, the slab. These peanuts gotta be about 25 foot deep to isolate the expansive soils uh, from the piers because the piers can lift the building. So this is San Antonio is another uh, crawl space kind of a building. You see these, these areas are shrinking, a lot of expansive soils and uh, you got the plumbing in there. So this is a structural slab system. That's the building right there. Structural slab with void boxes. So if you got a school building, you put void boxes underneath it. <clears throat> that void box basically deteriorates with time when it gets wet. So the expansive soils will swell into it. You put void boxes in the grade beams as well as in the floor slab areas. You put chairs in it. These are your beams, floor slab. Put steel in there. These are void boxes. Put them in the grade beams. That's your piers right there. Void boxes. You put them in the grade beams as well as in the floor slab areas. You put the sheets over it to for preventing from uh, basically uh, 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 punching holes when you put the steel in there. Um, you put vapor barrier there. We recommend a minimum of 10 mil. Ideally, 15 mil vapor barriers on top of the void boxes. On jobs that uh, you want to go quickly, you can also use the helical systems. Uh, if you got lots of sand and water and stuff like that, helicals are great systems. They're cheaper than drill piers uh, if you got to use a slurry method of construction. So um, you go out there and you just screw them into the ground. It goes underneath your grade beams and it's just really a Great foundation system that lasts about 75 years to resist rust. This is a site that using helicals to support the structure. These are small helicals. You just screw them into the ground. You can drill them into the ground and leave them in there in two days. I don't care if you've got water, sand, and stuff like that. So helicals are great systems. If you want to do a quick job, they can carry a lot of load. We need to use more of them. They're more expensive than drill piers when dry methods. But if you use uh, sandy soil, so if I'm parts of like Fort Bend ISD where I have a lot of sandy soils, these would be good. If you're out there in Conroe ISD, if you got a sandy area, it's real sandy. So helicals would be a good stuff. You just screw them into the ground. These are the plates that they call helixes. You just go in there and screw them into the ground, leave them in there. These are your beams. You put your helicals in there. And you put your steel in there. These are your helicals. And uh, if you want to have lateral capacity, <coughs> you drill it with a 12 inch hole or something like that in here, fill them up with concrete. That gives you more lateral resistance. Or you can do battered systems with helicals to resist uh, lateral loading. So there are great systems. You just put them in your great beams. You put your void boxes around them, then you put your steel. And of course, you can pour your slab over there. In areas where you got heavy loads, let's say you got uh, a stadium, you're going to go in there, you got lots of sandy soils south of Condor ISD or KD ISD. Uh, those things you may have to use auger cast piles. 
So if you got a project like this, you go out there and drill a hole out there with a hogger that's hollow, and you push grout in there. These are the augers who drill your holes. Could be 50 foot deep, 60 foot deep, like that. Got a hollow section, you pump grout through it. Then after you put the grout in, you get your steel cage, you just shove it in there in your grout. On your maintenance building, you can use what's called a conventional reinforcer slab type foundation. So that's a maintenance building. This is a, a new, new Kenny ISD. So any kind of a small building, you can do it just a slab on grade with interior beams. They're a great foundation. Good. You need to have positive drainage around it. You know, typically depending where you are, if you're out there in Fort Bend ISD, you need about, you know, 30 inch beams out there. 36 inch beams, Paraline ISD, friends with ISD. If I'm out there in KD ISD, you get away with 24 inch beams, 12 inches wide, beam spacing about, you know, 10, 12 foot spacing. If I'm in Fort Bend ISD, my beam spacing will be about 18 to eight foot. These are beams details where you put your steel out there, your gray beams. Your slab areas basically is a waffle slab system. You put your interior beams in it. And you make sure you're plumbing the guys did a good job. This is a lousy job. You got to go behind it and use jumping jack and compact it. Make sure you got a good slab on grade out there. You put your vapor barrier on top of it. You got to have to remove all the loose materials. This is your vapor barrier. If it uh, tears out, but you don't put uh, basically duct tape, you go in there and, and put it in a, basically a tape that uh, the manufacturer is requiring for your vapor barrier. These are your grade beams. Pump the concrete. Make sure you got chairs underneath this thing. You don't want the steel end up at the bottom of the concrete. You don't use roll wire mesh. Roll wire mesh use up at the bottom. This is not acceptable. This is not acceptable chairs. This is not acceptable the way you do this. You don't lift it. This is not acceptable. Steel is all the way, all the way in the bottom. This is not acceptable poor. The steel is all the way in the bottom. This is not acceptable. It's got to be in the mid height or two top two third. This is a totally not acceptable. You got the vapor barrier on top of the steel and pouring concrete on top of that. This is this guy here, Joe Six Pack here, doesn't know what he's doing. For spread footing, so if you're going to do some schools out there on, on spread footings, you go out there and dig your holes for spread footings. If you have high column loads and you have sandy soils with PIs, you know, less than 20. You can use the spread footings. You dig a hole and then you put your steel in it, pour concrete, you bring it up, columns. And here's our spread footings, small ones, pour your concrete over it. Now, some areas you may want to have to use chemical injections, so the smaller buildings. You know, on a chemical injection, what you use is called cation exchange. Typical clay plate plates, you got negative charge on it. Water has got positive charge. So clay soils in Fort Bend ISD or uh, some of the other ISD, you know, Alvin ISD and uh, Aleph ISD, you got a lot of clays. And uh, these clays get uh, basically saturated. They got these oak trees as well. And so what you do, you do chemical injection. You remove sodium or potassium. You put calcium in it, make the soil less expansive. So this double layer here becomes a smaller, it doesn't absorb as much water. So what happens is you get this uh, chemicals that you mix it in, in with water and uh, pump it onto the job site. This is Cinco Ranch. You, you just inject it all the way down to a depth of 10 foot. It's called chemical injection that reduces your PVR on your project. So if you wanna have a project, you can use combination of chemical injection and select fill on it for slabs save a bunch of money on the amount of heat that you can experience. The chemicals comes from these nozzles in here. They're about 24 inches of spaces. They put them in and uh, inject all the way to a depth of 10 foot. And uh, you get a no more than 0.8% swell in that soils to get your PVR to less than one inch. So this is called chemical injection. We're using on a lot of projects nowadays. You can also do them by hand, but they cannot penetrate very deep if you do it uh, by hand. 
Soils where chemical injections are effective are basically soils with secondary structures where you have a, lots of shrinkage cracks on them. This is A-Leaf ISD. You can see all the cracks in the soil. <clears throat> the soil, basically, uh, the chemicals can travel through the cracks and mix with the soil and reduce the heat. Trees. A lot of our ISDs, uh, we got a lot of trees near the buildings. You go out there to U of H and some of the stuff at Rice University, uh, you got some of these big oak trees right next to the buildings. And uh, some of the school district, this is A-Leaf ISD. You see the oak streaks near the buildings. And uh, a lot of these buildings, they got basically, uh, edge of the buildings are shrinking and settling because of presence of all these oak trees. This is Houston ISD project. So if your site is wooded, you got to cut all those beloved trees to build your building out there. These trees grow, grow three-dimensional. Three and uh, this is what we call a square root. If anybody wants to know what the square root means, that's a square root system. So these trees got <coughs> three-dimensional root systems. And you can see uh, some of the things that trees can do. Three-dimensional school uh, roots. This is my house out there. You got a tree growing right through it. Vacation house. Tree hugger. So um, when you all put uh, trees on the ground, uh, when you take out, uh, do side prep, make sure you, all the roots get out. There should not be any roots in your soil greater than half an inch. So you go out there, pour that slab, all these roots need to come out. But time, if you cut through your slabs, those roots deter deteriorate and create void spaces where water to travel underneath your slab and cause heave. So make sure all the roots are out removed when you do site prep. Root heave. Trees affect foundations in three ways. One of them calls root heave, which roots go underneath the buildings and underneath the walls and start lifting up the structure, trying to get moisture. This is one of the architects downtown. If you go out there near Eastern IST, and you can see what the tree's doing to the sidewalk going underneath it. This is a house out there uh, near Ailey ISD. There was this willow tree here, and uh, this floor slab was heaved up. They didn't know why. We dug it next to the grade beams, and we saw this two inch diameter root going under the slab. This is out there near the Woodlands area near Condra ISD. And, uh, and and basically in that area, uh, you got this uh, the pine tree go out there next to the house. It's basically, it travels underneath the floor slabs. Pine trees are really bad. The slab was heaped up. They didn't know why. They jackhammered the floor slabs. That's what they pulled out. So when we go out there and look at these uh, slabs, when you jackhammer, you see all the roots underneath them. Some of these roots get pretty big underneath your slabs. So you do not put trees next to the foundation system because these roots go on there and suck the water and call settlement or they actually heave the slab. Basically, they start lifting it. <clears throat> uh, so here's another area where they had tree roots. We had to remove the tree roots, compact the area, put the new vapor barrier, put steel in, and pool concrete. Soil heave due to tree removal. So those, those ISDs that they got a lot of trees, which is a lot of ISDs in Houston we have, that have a lot of trees and expansive soils. When you take out that tree out there, uh, try to build your school, these oak trees, by the way, trees don't know anything about property line. If this tree dies here, this building here is gonna move up. So it doesn't matter, you got a fence there. So you gotta have to design for your area, for your building, assuming these trees gonna die eventually, so that these buildings do not, do not heave. Even if there's a fence here, the sites that are wooded, the soils are basically so dry, these root systems suck all that moisture out, and uh, the soil becomes really dry in that area. So if you go out there and a couple of years later, you see that area of the tree was removed, uh, you can see the, the heave out here. So... And you can see the tree heave over here. This was a school building here. The tree was moved near point H1. 
<coughs> highly expansive soils. When this tree was taken out at point H1, point H, with time, soil rehydrated and moved to about 6.3 inches. And it was going on all the way down to about 30 years. Point F that's far away moved only one inch. So when you cut a tree and you build a school building on top of it, that soil is going to heave up. So if you're on there in HISD building of a you know a school near Bel Air High School or somewhere else, that whole area you got to design for these highly expansive soils. You got to design for tree removal. So if you got this big tree in here and you want to build a building in here, these trees got big roots out there that travel all the way up to here. So when you take that tree, look at the moisture profile underneath it. You go all the way to ten feet or so. You see all these deficient moisture areas. It all the way goes twice the height of the tree. This is three foot deep. So to twice out of the tree, which is 100 foot away, you still is sucking moisture all the way down to a depth of three feet. Underneath the, the where the trunk, tree trunk is, right in here, it sucks moisture all the way down to a 10 foot depth. So if this is the building, the, 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 the zone of moisture removal is twice the height of the tree, to a depth of about three feet, to a depth of 10 feet. So this area is totally dry. So if you're gonna go out and pull the building out there, you gotta design for it. So you got a tree like this, basically the drip line of the tree is less than the tree root spread. So the tree root spread is bigger than the drip line. This is a house out there in, um, in Austin they had three trees out here. The soil's PI was between 50 and 60. They removed these trees. Within two weeks, the soil moved up 8.2 inches. The soil rehydrated. Texas A&M did a bunch of research on trees in expansive soils. They said it, about, it takes about five years for the tree to rehydrate. So when we do jobs out there in A&M, we basically go with structural slab with void. We don't even mess around with the effect, you know, put stuff on top of expansive soils. Put deep piers with structural slab. Soil shrinkage due to re tree moisture removal. So we were out there looking at the uh, Houston Community College downtown. They had these oak trees out there right next to the building. This is the building in there. These trees got underneath the, the foundation system, which was only 12 foot deep. Which essentially the piers were too shallow. So the building was working as a floating stab system. So they sucked the moisture, the edge of the building dropped, cracked. So we had to go back and put foundation recommendations for underpinning to heave up, to, to lift that slab up. This is the crack inside the building. So Texas, uh, University of Texas at Arlington did a bunch of research on the effects of trees on buildings. They said the future height of the tree and distance from a building for DH over by one, which is 50 foot away, if your tree is 50 foot from a building with time that can cause 0.2 feet of differential movement, which corresponds to about 2.4 inches. So when you put the trees next to your building, these trees tend to suck the moisture out and cause the edge of your building to shrink and drop. They create these void underneath your floor slabs and uh, the slab starts sagging and settling. So this is a kind of a, a tree species deal uh, table that uh, I've got developed here. Uh, for oak tree, you want to put them 16 to 23 feet uh, maximum height of the tree uh, that can have separation between the building for 75% me meters uh, is 13 meters or one H away from the building. So for, from oak trees, you want to put them one H future height, ideally 50 feet away. I know you're going to put it at 20 feet. With time, that is going to cause poplar. Poplar, 1H. Lime, 0.5H. Plain, 0.5H. Willow trees, 1H. Elm tree, 0.5H. Hawthorn, 0.5. Beech, 0.5. Birch, 0.5. Cypress, 0.5H. So you got to put them away from the building depending on the tree species. So this section of the presentation was trees from hell. Any questions? Any questions on the trees and stuff? Okay, well, if you have no questions, we're going to move on. Some measures to uh, prevent tree di distress. 
put the trees away from the building as much as you can. Okay, you know, like I said, you know, 20 feet may not be enough, but that's a minimum of 20 feet away. Uh, you can cause uh, depressions around the building so that water comes in and roots do not have to travel trying to get moisture. Put sprinkler systems out there and you basically wet the soil so that the, 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 the tree roots do not have to go out underneath your building and get moisture. Put root barriers in when you put the trees in the ground. Put them with root barriers. These are vertical. Roots come out vertical. They don't go lateral. So you plant the tree with root barriers. These are root barriers. We recommend them at least four foot deep, five foot deep uh, around the buildings, around the trees. You can put herbicide pills. They stun the root systems. They last 10 years. Bio barriers. They don't last very good. We don't recommend them. Put pots around your building. You don't have to put trees out there. This is a capital bank out there in Westheimer, and they put pots around their buildings, got rid of all their landscaping areas because of all the problems. Parking facilities. So this is, uh, a, you know, Fort Ben ISD project here. See the concrete paving going on out there? It's the driveways, uh, stadium parking, asphalt parking out there in New Caney ISD. Bus, bus drive facilities. You know, this is the Sheldon ISD bus facility out here. They got concrete paving over here. That's a uh, Cypher ISD. So we do the pavement design based on Ashton and Asphalt Institute at ACI. So for general parking, we go with five inch concrete paving over stabilized subgrade. Bus lines, seven inches over stabilized subgrade. Driveways, we want to have a, at least six inch concrete and stabilized subgrade with lime. If you're in Fort Bend ISD, Santa Fe ISD, Alvin ISD, Lamar Consolidated, and you use fly ash if you're in Katy ISD, Royal ISD, Cypher, Tombald, and you know, Magnolia, Waller. So those areas use lime fly ash. Asphalt paving. If you want to go cheap, you can use asphalt, but life cycle costs going to be the same. You can use typically for general parking, two inches of asphalt, six inches of base, and the six inches of stabilized subgrade. For driveways, you go three inches of asphalt, eight inches of uh, base, and inches of stabilized subgrade. So, uh, stabilized subgrade with lime or fly ash, depending where you're located. If you're Dayton ISD, how would you be using lime? Huffman ISD, mostly sandy. I would use flash. Dumpster pads. When you have dumpster pads, these truck going to come in and try to lift this dumps, trash and all that stuff. So what you do is uh, use re and reinforce these areas. If you use concrete or asphalt for concrete paving, use seven inches of concrete over stabilized subgrade. And then uh, six inches of stabilized, I would say, uh, for asphalt paving. Three inches of asphalt, eight inches of space, over at least eight inches of subgrade stabilized soils. So, bleachers. Sam Houston and State University out there, they got beautiful bleachers out there. This is New Caney ISD. Uh, New Caney, this is Splendora ISD. So depending on size of your bleachers, they're supported on piers, okay? And you know they got a lot of uplift loading on these things. So you put them on piers, these are the columns. Uh, on a small Magnolia ISD bleachers, you just have a slab and you screw down your small bleacher uh, into, the, uh, into the slab that you have. So these bleachers are subject to lateral loading, uh, bending, and also compression, gravity loading. So when you look at these columns for these things, you got to design for lateral load, uh, compression, uplift, and bending. So for lateral loads and all that, use L pile system, PY curves, that allows the piers over here. You get the measured deflections. That's the PY curves over here, and of course, uh, designed for those things. This is the L pile design parameters. I know we've got some structural engineers in the audience. So for depending on the soils, we give you the K value 
E50 and go unit weight, undrained shear strength. So you can model that in your uh, L pile foundation to resist the design of the moment in shear and drill piers. Uh, poles, the same concept. These poles carry a lot of load. They got wind loading, compression loading, and bending moments that you got to design for. So they are set most likely on piers. We don't put them on shallow foundations. They got to go on pier foundations. And these poles are subject to many loads. Here's a pole right there. You can see them right there. They're subject to lateral bending, compression, uplift, tension loading. So again, you got to design these poles for uplift, lateral, compression, and bending moments. Signs. You got a project like New Kenny ISD here, and you can see uh, these signs are subject to major wind loading. They're sitting on piers. So you got to go out there. This is a Hall Stadium Fort Bend ISC sign. This is a Sam Houston uh, University sign. This is Sheldon ISD sign. So these piers are subject to lateral bending, compression, uplift loading. So these signs got to be designed for lateral uplift and compression loading on piers. Running tracks. Questions. Okay, we got a question here. All PY curve can model is selected. What are the criteria to define PY curve model? Uh, we develop PY curves based, based on the soil types. You got a clay soil, sandy soils. We have different PY curves for these type of soils. So depending on that, uh, we def define it, come up with a PY curve. If you want to know more about it, shoot me an email. I'll send you information on PY curves. Running tracks. And, you know, this is a Splendor ISD and a running track in here. Um, you can see that rubber on the top right there. Some of these running tracks, they got drains right next to them to get that surface water off. This is Hall Stadium, Fort Bend ISD. Again, you can see the design and construction of the running tracks. She will be in accordance with the American Sports Builders Association to come up with those things. Um, so make sure you look at that document, the Sports Builders Association for design of running tracks. If you do running tracks, if you got asphalt, you got your surface rubber material, then underneath it, you got two inches of asphalt, six inches of base, six inches of stabilized subgrade. For running track where you got concrete underneath, you got the surface rubber material. You know that you got five inches of concrete and six inches of stabilized layer. All this can be changed just depending on the manufacturer and who you're dealing with when you do these uh, running tracks. But you got your basically, you got track surfacing here, then you got asphalt, then you got your base on a stabilized subgrade, typical basically designed for this thing. Here's again, you can see where you got the concrete. And on top of that, you got that rubbery material that you use for your running track. Here's another one, rubbery materials that you use over concrete or asphalt. Geotechnical report requirements, of course, for running tracks. You got to define the subsoil conditions, water table, frost depths, drainage, drains out there, subgrade stabilization, and full depth of asphalt or concrete construction. So, uh, um, for running tracks on expansive soils, if you don't want your running track to move around, Stabilize soils below the track with lime or flash. Now, remember, if you're out there in a leaf ISD or Fort Bend ISD or Alvin ISD, your active zone is 10 foot. So if you like to stabilize top six or eight inches, it's not going to do anything for you for movements. If you want to reduce the movement to PBR less than one inch, you got to do chemical injections underneath your running track to a depth of 10 feet. You need to have positive drainage or drains around your running tracks. If you're in KDI ISD and you have running tracks and your subgrade pumping may occur, you got to remove top two feet of sand and put in select fill, line flash your subgrade and have positive drainage. 
Line fly axis T six to eight inches. You're basically select fill. You're going to have a soil with liquid limit less than 40 pi between 12 and 20. In expansive soil areas, you got to do chemical injections uh, to, to a depth of 10 feet in Houston and 15 feet or so, Dallas, San Antonio, and Austin to get your PVR down. Turf. It's a big deal out there. This is Sam Houston State University. They, they've got a uh, nice turf out there in their stadium. If you go out and look at it, it's a new Kenya ISD turf. Right, beautiful work there. You can see that this is Sam Houston again. You can see the turf out there. Design and construction of turf would be in accordance with the American Sports and Builders Association. They got typical designer for turf. You got a synthetic turf at the top. Below that, you got two inches of leather rock. Below that is six inches of base rock. Below that, usually you got a 12, 20 mil geomembrane. Below that, you got six inches of a stabilized layer. So your typical, you know, you got your turf in there. And some of these, you put sand in it to keep it vertical, the, 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 the turf itself. Below that, you got a leveling layer. Below that, you got crushed limestone, textile 247. And below that, you got your drain and mem uh, membrane. And below that, you got your stabilized layer there. And in some areas where you got the gravel, you put your drain in to go get that water here, got drain it underneath your uh, member, your drain, your turf out there. So a typical gradation for your leveling rock is a half an inch, 100% through, uh, got to pass 100% uh, through the sieve of one and a half inch, 85 to 100% should pass 33 eighths of an inch, 10 to 30% should pass number four, zero to 10%. Number eight, zero to five, number 16. It's a typical specification for leveling rock from uh, the sports association deal that I just mentioned. For your base rock, 100% should pass one and, one, one and a half inch uh, sieve. 95 to 100% should pass one inch sieve. 80% should pass three fourths, so forth. And number 200, one, one, one to 4% by weight. You gotta have to have a drainage layer. So if you got a turf, if you cut that turf and roll it over, first of all, you can see a bunch of sand that's coming out of it. That sand kind of keeps the turf straight. And then you got that basically the, the drainage layer underneath it. Below that, you got that leveling type material out there, small grade type stuff. That's called base layer underneath that. You run density, make sure everything is compact, 100% standard proctor density, so that this thing does not settle. That's what it looks like. Below that, you got an impermeable fabric. That's where it sits right there. So basically a 10 mil or 15 mil or 20 mil. I don't know what the number was. I just went through it. And uh, yeah, that's an impermeable uh, layer that you should put in there. Uh, below that, you got your stabilized layer, your lime fly shed or uh, that soil underneath it. If your soils are sandy, if you have clay, you lime it. Turf side drains. You know, when you put turf in there, you gotta put side drains to drain that water off the, uh, basically the turf. You may have underground systems that the PVC pipes that come to your side drain to get that water out. Uh, one of the important things when we do turf design is the infiltration rate. We wonder how much water infiltrates in the soil below the turf. So basically you put two concentric metal rings, it's called double ring infiltration test, 12 and 24 inches in diameter, place them four inches below the, uh, the base, when you add water, you measure the water readings at 15, 30, and 60 minutes, and you calculate the infiltration rate. That's a, uh, basically the system. You got double, double cylinder system in here. Uh, you put water in it. This is the central one. That's what the one you use for actual measurements. And then this is the outer limit to keep the area wet and keep the lateral movement and make sure the uh, the the uh, the the water goes vertical down in the center one. So you start adding water to it. 
The inner ring measures the, the vertical flow. The outer ring is used to promote one dimensional uh, vertical flow beneath the inner ring. All measurements are made through the inner ring. Typical of fluid infiltration rates are 10 inch per hour, 12 inch per hour, or five inch per hour. When you deal with your, uh, your manufacturer of your turf, you got to look at all those things. You got to look at those gradation and we can help you with a lot of that stuff. Tennis courts on your school projects are going to have a bunch of tennis courts and they come in concrete or asphalt, uh, earthwork. You got to go out there and proof roll the area. Make sure you put the, the same thing goes with your paving. Make sure that uh, you get a 25 ton, ton truck. You load it up and go back and forth. You don't, you know, it's not acceptable underneath your building or paving or your tennis court. It's not acceptable. Compact everything with the sheep's foot. If your soils are clay or use a steel drum roller, seal it, sandy soils. So your tennis courts out there, you do concrete tennis courts, four inches of concrete, steel reinforcement together with the exterior grade beam. It's a typical system. You got your beams. Uh, exterior beam, and then you got uh, steel in here on chairs. Start pumping that concrete in there. You finish it. Trowel it. It's kind of that's what it looks like. Surface surface tolerance is uh, basically it says should not vary more than one eighth of an inch and ten feet in any direction. So they got to be pretty flat there. Post finishing tennis courts. They're not any better than a uh, regular concrete tennis courts, and you got to design for them. There are four inches of concrete, post tension cables, three to five foot spacing. There will be a perimeter grade beam. So that's your uh, your steel cables on chairs out there. You got your perimeter grade beam right there. You got your steel coming out, the live ends. Start pouring the concrete. This is the live end, this is a dead end. The dead end right there. Stop pouring the concrete and pump it. You're, that's your paving, uh, your tennis court. <clears throat> Again, the surface uh, tolerance should be the same. No more than one eighth of an inch in 10 foot. You uh, pull those cables, basically. You, you spray them first. Then you start uh, measuring elongations. And it has to meet the certain elongations. Uh, basically, one in uh, 10 feet, 12 feet, and uh, one inch in 12 feet for a typical four inch uh, slab. You got to design these uh, post uh tennis courts. Otherwise, if you have movements, if you don't want to have movements, so let's say, let's say you're in Clear Creek ISD or Alvin or Fort Bend, uh, you got to do chemical injections to a depth of 10 feet if you want to keep the movement less than one inches. Here's where you pull the, the cables, you make sure your jack is calibrated. Initially, you, you put uh, lots of load on this thing, about 33 kips in tension in these cables. With time, it drops to about 28, 20, 28.9 kips. And with years, it drops to about 26 kips. When you put tension in this co concrete, it puts compression on the concrete uh, and uh, that's less cracking. But if your soles are expansive, this whole thing's gonna still move. And at the end, you gotta go out there and cut the end. Uh, asphalt tennis courts, they're typical two inches of asphalt. Six inches of base, about six inches of stabilized subgrade. And uh, so you go in there and you compact that soil underneath it. You put your crushed limestone in there, compact 100% modified proctor density. You put your prime coat on top of it. Then you start putting your asphalt in there and you get rollers and start Compacting that uh, asphalt for your tennis court. That's an asphalt tennis court. They're okay if your soils are sandy, but if you got gumbo clay, they're going to crack. So, I'm, I mean, I'm not really a fan of asphalt tennis court. I'd rather to use a post tension or a concrete tennis court. And they got to be properly designed for the soils that are out there. Otherwise, you're going to experience heave, tennis court movement ten tolerance. We talked about it one inch and ten, uh, ten uh, one eighth of an inch and ten, ten feet. You don't want it to move around a lot. Here's some pictures of the tennis courts that are cracked up, not properly designed. Water is coming through it, the perch water table. So there's a lot of old looking uh, tennis courts. 
not in good shape. Again, they got to be properly designed. In the areas where you got expansive soils, you got to go out there and do chemical injections in Houston area to a depth of 10 feet in the tennis courts. Natatoriums and pools, uh, you got to have to design a property, otherwise, you're going to have movement. You can see here in the, this pool in here, you got expansive soils. This side is coming up. This is a floating pool system. Okay, this is a, usually the shallow end of the pool will come up due to heave. This is in Friendswood area, and, and uh, you got the, the, the pool has got highly expansive soils. You got a floating pool. That was one side of the pool. And here's the other, you know, this is the one side of the pool, this is the other side of the pool coming up. This is a vanishing edge pool. There's a big drop right next to it. That's near Memorial. The edge drop that in design for the slope. There's a major litigation. And it's another pool out there in West University area. The people wanted to clean the pool and uh, that in relieve the hydrostatic by cutting some holes underneath the pool. It rained over the weekend. The hydrostatic pressure pushed the pool out of the ground, about 18 inches, 15 inches, just came out like that. They sued. The insurance company said it's safe, sanitary, and livable. They didn't pay them anything. There's another pool out there in Cypher, Fairbank, uh, ISD area, but the hydrostatic pressure pushed it all the way up. When you do pools out there, if your soils are non-expansive, you go out there and put your steel in there. And of course,